I've always wanted to use my passions and my skills in helping somehow. I think from my past experiences where I think the nature of architecture and, and the role of the architects, you tend to kind of work for people from a higher income bracket because they actually have the budget, they have um, probably the wants to pay for good design and to pay for kind of signature projects. So I always say that you have the star architects who are more like sculptors and you know, they're star buildings, but you don't tend to kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of the responses as well, it's a great building, it looks great, but the people actually working in the building don't actually think it's a good building. So for me, I think when the recession hit, kind of reached the point where, you know, it's great working on hotel projects, it's great working on bungalows, um, and you know, the clients are nice enough, demanding, yes, but, but you know, nice enough, and, and they're up for, um, wanting to push design, which I think is great. Um, but for me personally, I felt, well, during this kind of hard time that you're working basically three people's jobs and long hours and the pay isn't great, unfortunately, and I don't think it still is, but, um, but that's the nature of the profession. So it's, you have to love what you do. Then, um, then I basically then did a Google research to see if there were charities that would employ architects to actually do community building projects. And through the research and even now, there were only three architecture charities that would actually employ architects to help them build communities. And one of them was actually Architecture for Humanity. Now, I'll talk about kind of its successes and its downfalls, because unfortunately, in 2016, the charity actually went bankrupt. So I'll talk more about that later. But Architecture Humanity, um, they won a big contract to help ET rebuild post earthquake Now, I don't know whether you, know, you remember back in 2010, the massive earthquake that devastated Haiti. Now, personally for me, I had no connection to Haiti. I, to be honest, I, it wasn't even on my radar hadn't been to the Caribbean, but what actually struck me was the 2004 tsunami that hit Southeast Asia. Because I was actually back at home in Singapore when the tsunami hit our neighboring countries. And for me, at that time, because I was still in architecture school, I couldn't actually take time out to go and help um, during the tsunami. So then when, when the Haitian earthquake happened, this happened in 2010, and it was also at the time of pretty much the UK economy being quite low. And unfortunately, in the state of, in the industry of architecture, there weren't many jobs. Or if you were in a job, they were either cutting your pay and making you work long hours. So that was kind of where I was at in my career. And when I did my research for architectural charities, then, then Architecture Humanity came up and they were looking for volunteers to come out for minimum a month, maximum a year or more. Then at this point, it was kind of the summer of, of 2010, that I said to my mom, I was like, oh, do you mind if I go to Haiti? Um, I'm gonna take this career break and I'll just see where this leads. And at that point, my mom was like, where's Haiti? What is this? What are you gonna do? Do you know anyone? What, what are you thinking? So then she was, and then in the end she's like, just go for it. You know, because you've got nothing to lose, just, just quit your job um, as long as you're safe. So, um, so then I decided, I was like, okay, great, I'm going to go to Haiti. Um, didn't know anyone, just messaged Architecture Humanity, they gave me a welcome pack, and I had to get air tickets, visas, medical insurance, and what they provided was accommodation, um, transportation, um, and a stipend. So, not a massive salary, but to me, I'm like, enough for me to survive in a place like Haiti. Um, for those of you who don't know where Haiti is, um, it's actually in the Caribbean <coughs> Islands. It is actually, it, it is one of the largest 
Caribbean islands, making up the whole area. But unfortunately, it's the poorest. And 80% of the 10 million population actually survive on only <coughs> one dollar 25 a day. So 80% of the 10 million population live in abject poverty. So for me, going out there, I just didn't know what to expect. I, I've never been to a disaster zone, so this is me hopping on a plane, and it's nine months after the earthquake. Um, someone from Architecture Humanity emailed me back saying, yes, we'll hold a sign, we'll come meet you at the airport. <coughs> looking forward to you coming. So, great. Then I think it dawned on me on the plane that, what am I doing? I've just, I've just come to a place where actually, you know, it's not the safest. It's just recovering or, I mean, you know, more about, about it later, but even 10 years after the earthquake, it's still recovering. So I had no idea what to expect, but I just kind of went with an open mind and go, well, someone's going to meet me there. They should know the way of the land, and they should keep me safe. And if something were to happen, then so be it. So that was kind of my attitude after a bit of a panic. <laughs> but, um, and as you can see, it's, it's actually a very beautiful country. So from, from the sky, it actually <coughs> has beautiful emerald beaches, like most like you would imagine the Caribbean. But I think one thing I didn't anticipate was the sheer devastation and the inequality between rich and poor. And having grown up in Southeast Asia, you know, I've, I've seen poverty. I've, I've even um, as a project, I went out to Cambodia to help um, build houses there. I think the poverty there in, in Southeast Asia is different to the poverty that I've experienced in Haiti. And I think that's what really struck me. Um, more about that later. So I joined Architecture for Humanity, and their main projects were actually rebuilding schools. So that was kind of my experience here from Scotland, that, um, which was why they were keen for me to go out to help them rebuild kind of pretty much 90% of all their primary schools and high schools all collapsed during the earthquake. So they were left with rubble. So this was the main kind of um, funding stream for Architecture for Humanity. So they worked with a lot of high-profile celebrities. So one, one of our clients um, was Ben Stiller and Stiller Sean Foundation. Another client was Sean Penn and his J-Pro Foundation. Another client was Shakira. And, and so you know because the Haitian earthquake attracted a lot of attention. And not only that, it's also proximity-wise, it's very close to the US. And <coughs> even till today, its closest kind of ally is the United States. So a lot of their income stream, a lot of um, aid agencies tend to be more the American organizations. And that's where Architecture of Humanity was based. They were based in San Francisco. Their funding came from a lot of American um, grant bodies or celebrities. Because Haiti was such a high profile case that a lot of celebrities wanted to be part of it somehow. Um, now, for me, I thought, okay, great, this is a charity, an architectural charity. It's very rare, but they do good work. They, they've been in operation for about 11 years before they entered into Haiti, and I think they did a great job. Um, but being in Haiti, and being as corrupt as Haiti is, I kind of first-hand witnessed perhaps where money should have been spent but was spent on something else. And I think that kind of was one of the downfalls for architecture for humanity. So with a school project like this, as you can see the scale of it, it's massive. And in Haiti, land is expensive, expertise is expensive, materials is expensive, because everything is imported. So they don't have um, local resources. When it comes to construction, why the devastation was so bad was none, or I would say, at least 75% of 
of buildings that were built in Haiti didn't actually have foundations. So when you think about an earthquake jolting the room, you need foundations to give it the extra support for the building to be able to withstand movement in the ground. <coughs> in Haiti, this is where um, corruption is really rife, why should we spend money on something we can't see? And that was their justification for not having foundations. So the only building that actually withstood the earthquake was, um, it's the only sky, skyscraper, skyscraper um, in Haiti, and it's actually the Digicel building. So Digicel is a telecommunications company, but it's actually owned by an Irish billionaire. And he, um, after the earthquake, um, had a fund for Irish architects to come out to Haiti to help rebuild. So in Architecture Humanity, I actually worked with a group of Irish architects, and they were funded by Digicel. And the owner of Digicel actually employed an Irish architect to come and build his office tower in Haiti, which was why it was the only building that withstood the earthquake. And I remember um, a friend of mine who lived there, he said he lived very near the Digicel building, could actually see the building sway. And he honestly thought that building was going to collapse, the glass was going to kill him because of the movement. But that building, only one window broke during the earthquake. So it, it highlights the importance of building well. And it highlights to me the importance of why architects are needed in such, um, in such situations. It might not be immediate, so you have your temporary shelters, but in terms of rebuilding and long term, this is where architects can come in. Now, what, one of the things that Architecture Humanity tried to do was engage the community. So it's also about using what resources they have and what technology that they can understand. So how you draft it there, everything had to be in French. But again, French is only spoken or Britain's French is only written by kind of the 20% or maybe 10% of the population who are actually educated. So you're working with local construction workers who can't even read French. And we were issuing construction drawings that were in French. And to be honest, they couldn't even understand reading three-dimensional drawings. So one thing we had the challenge of was coming with our training, our expertise, thinking that we can come in there, design how we usually would design back in our home countries, and they would know what to do. That was not the case. There was a lot of education that needed. Now going back to the, the analogy of, of not having foundations, the way they build the concrete blocks um, unfortunately, I had a video that showed the density of these concrete blocks, but for some reason I just couldn't find it um, for the presentation. But literally this video showed using an empty plastic bottle, whacking a concrete block, and that plastic bottle making that block crumble. So, you know, it's, it's, it's things that you experience there and you don't really hear about which was why the devastation of the earthquake was so extreme, because people were living in structures that acted like pancakes when, when it came to an earthquake, that literally it just flattened and it just crumbled, which was why their estimation of almost 300,000 people dying in that earthquake, I would say is quite accurate, but they don't have proper statistics because of the way he is, they don't keep track of its citizens. Um, which again, kind of seeing the architecture for humanity had quite a good responsibility or had a good advantage of, of building that better. And that was the initiative that the government wanted organizations like theirs to be able to provide. Now, 
The positive is that, coming back here, um, <coughs> that in its five year period in Haiti, 50 projects were finished that included homes, medical clinics, offices, and 30 <coughs> schools, which I think is impressive for the duration that they were in Haiti. But unfortunately, because of Haiti, and I do believe it is because of Haiti, that they became bankrupt. They had to file for bankruptcy in 2015. And subsequently, in 2016, the owners or the founders of Architecture Humanity was actually sued for mismanagement of funds. <laughs> now, to kind of contextualize Haiti as well, is about 13.3 billion US dollars was pledged to help Haiti rebuild. Now, for every 100 US dollars that was donated to Haiti, only a dollar 10 actually went to a local Haitian or to a local Haitian business. So when you're trying to rebuild an economy, money needs to be kind of cycled within the economy, within its own country, within its people. Now, this is where I can get quite, um, quite angry because the US comes in and pledges all this money but actually, majority of the money that they have pledged in goes back into the US economy because they have to buy materials. So instead of locally sourcing local materials, they import it from the US. They work with companies that have the expertise that's back in the US. So all of that money is kind of being recycled back into the US economy instead of remaining in Haiti. And and that's where I think caused a lot of the downfall for architecture for humanity because the cost of living is expensive in Haiti. And the minute they know you work for an NGO or for um, a foreign company, rent is 10 times higher. So we're living in a house where it's kind of a like big brother situation where you have 35 people live under one roof and you had pump beds. But the rent of that house was astronomical. <coughs> so a lot of their funding had to provide things like that. And then transportation, you can't just walk on the streets by yourself. So then you had to pay for cars. Cars, then you had to pay for drivers. Drivers, then you had to pay for fuel. And in the last couple of years, the <coughs> is actually facing a fuel crisis. And the government is wanting to increase the cost of fuel um, but the citizens can't then afford it. And then it's kind of the cycle again. So you're dealing with a country that is just not straightforward. And it is expensive and it is highly corrupt. So when it comes to actually trying to build and, and offer kind of responses, this is where I think it's, it's understanding the community, working with the community to be able to provide kind of local solutions. Um, but I still strongly believe that I think architects, the future architects, there is a way <coughs> for you in such situations, but it's actually needing you to kind of come in from a grassroots level, to be able to understand the situation people are in, to communicate better, and perhaps find sustainable solutions that actually uses and utilizes local resources. Um, so, um, shortly after they completed all their projects in Haiti, Architecture for Humanity then were um, sued for mismanagement, which is why um, I think a few of you I've, I've lectured uh, about the importance of the business plan and why business is really important is because of this. I think for architecture for humanity, it's very hard to fundraise for design because people can't see the value of why they should put a cost to good design. But knowing Haiti and understanding Haiti, the result is actually building better. 
So it doesn't have to be these fancy sculptures, but this is where architects can come in and you can actually build better. And your expertise can actually help in terms of development, but perhaps not in a way that we are trained back here or our experiences of how architecture practices work um, in developed countries. So that then leads me to coming back here after three and a half months in Haiti, being dismayed by the development sector, being discouraged by um, how architecture is built um, and how you can't really progress much there, that the one thing that I witnessed when I was on the ground was actually artists. So in some of our building projects, we try to engage local artisan communities <coughs> to be able to integrate some of their designs into projects in Haiti. But again, it was very difficult to be able to push for that when a lot of the budget had to go to making sure the schools or the houses were earthquake-proof as well as hurricane-proof. Um, and not only that, that there was also security issues as well in how um, to protect the space from vandalism um, and to protect the students. So as much as we wanted to integrate more of the artisan touches within the design, within the projects, um, that wasn't always possible. So when I returned um, back here to Edinburgh, um, I had bought some artwork as gifts for family and friends. Um, I, didn't, I had no notion of setting up my own business because that was not kind of what I had planned to do. But, you, know, you don't go through six years of education um, with four years of working experience to then not become an architect, right? Because there's an added expense, there's a long time. Um, but then when I came back, um, a few of my friends um, said, oh, why don't you give a talk? Because everyone wants to know um, about your experience, they want to hear what you've done. Um, and basically that was kind of the testing ground um, and showcasing of the arts that I kind of fell in love with in Haiti. And that was when I also then decided to embark on a business degree. So it was actually that experience in Haiti that made me see that the most sustainable solution in helping countries like Haiti is actually through sustainable business. That you have to provide jobs. And that will help the country grow and rebuild. So as much as, as um, I would have liked to kind of remain within architecture, I just felt that this was kind of um, at that time, where I needed to go. So then in business school, um, it was pretty much one of the hardest years of my life, even having done six years of architecture school. The business degree was really challenging, the sheer fact that it's a completely different language. And when you're in architecture school, you're, you're very creative. You're thought to kind of design spaces, um, to be creative with, with um, you know, inside outside space and, and concepts and theories. But then the business degree teaches you about the economy, accounting, finance, macroeconomics, business ethics, um, inclusive development, um, and, and marketing. And I think after semester one, I was like, why did I do this? This is, this is just not for me. I was just really stressed and. I'm not really a numbers person either, but having done that degree, I feel a lot more confident with numbers, which is why I think I just took the leap and then started up the social enterprise. So it was actually um, at the end of the business degree that I actually entered into a business plan competition, that that was the starting point of Fourth World Art. And it was a pitching competition, a bit like Dragon's Den, that we had to stand in front of four judges and pitch your business idea and defend your business plan. And one of the judges actually, um, he in the end um, offered me a deal that if I came to work for him, he'd help me and support me with my business. 
Now, he worked in property investment. So for two years after I finished my business degree, I actually worked in property investment. And it was selling Scottish property um, back in Asia. So it meant that I got sent to Asia every three months, being the spokesperson for Scottish property and Scottish culture, and, and why it's such a good investment um, to invest in the Scottish <coughs> property market. So in a way, it was good. Um, it was very educational because it meant that I can apply my learned business skills <coughs> in a practical setting. But it wasn't where my passion lied. And um, after two years, I kind of parted ways. Um, but he was kind enough to then help me rent a space um, where I can then develop the business and concentrate on the business. And this is where Fourth World Art um, developed. So in Haiti, their galleries are literally street pavements. Um, there are formalized galleries that are owned by two or three families that have settled in Haiti. And that's where it's more of a highbrow, kind of fine art collector's market. For me, what really struck me was the guys in the street. They, didn't, they don't have tourism. They don't have, um, they have what you call um, aid tourists. So these are people working for aid agencies that come into Haiti. And they also have their own kind of Haitians that come back to visit relatives. So the majority of these people would be the ones buying this art as gifts to take back home. And coming back from Haiti, I said, well, if there's a way that I can support the artists, then it's my continued way to kind of help them without donating money to charities because I don't know where the money's going. But at least I know if I buy the art, it's actually going to a local Haitian. So then that is the basis of the idea of why I then set up the business. But if you can see there, the oil drums. So that's what took my eye. These oil drums are actually discarded in Haiti. It's, it's kind of a dumping ground. And back in the 70s, it was actually a French artist that thought, well, we can use that as a material. Why don't we utilize that, recycle it, and turn it into something beautiful like artwork? And that's kind of what really struck me, was these oil drums being turned into pieces of art. So that was kind of the passion behind why I decided to start up Fourth World Art. Um, but the diversity <coughs> of artwork that Haiti actually creates is actually huge. They have local sandstone that they create little sculptures from. They use this wooden material called vetiver, where vetiver oil is something that they're really trying to promote now in Haiti to sell because it has health benefits, but actually the branches of that can be turned into art. So then you've got these <coughs> called oil drums, and you've also got paintings. Now the paintings are painted not on traditional canvases. They're literally painted on fabric that they find from the streets. So I've got one piece of painting that's actually painted on a pair of jeans, another painting that was painted on linen, um, another painting that was painted on just kind of um, um, a curtain as well. So for me, that, that is what really struck me and that's what I kind of wanted to support. Now to tie it back into architecture, which is why I think the, the theme of this discussion, edges of architecture, I think um, actually helped me think about where the future is for the dark. And one thing I, I truly believe is, is building an art center, a community art center in Haiti. Because crime is so high in Haiti, but the population is also very young. That if you can actually enthuse the young through apprenticeship programs, like something like an artisan craft, like creating um, metal oil drum art, then I believe that then that would give them more stability, it would give them an income as an artist, and it would give them a job. And then that can then help them get <coughs> out of the cycle. Um, and at the moment, I'm just focusing on the business side of things to kind of build the brand, 
to build a revenue stream so that then the profits can then fund an architectural response um, and that would be a community art centre. So I have a friend that I actually met through um, my work through development and through Haiti um, and he currently works in Australia and he actually also works with Aboriginal communities and building art centres for them. So we're in the process of talking about perhaps um, bringing in Aboriginal artwork as part of Fourth World Arts um, selling unit. Um, again, it's, it's about the marginalised, it's about forgotten communities trying to kind of end the cycle of poverty and using art to do that as a tool. Um, I know I've kind of like rambled on and there's quite a lot of content there, so um, I think it would help if you have any questions, more specific questions that, that I can answer. You can kind of click on that. Do you work on your own or do you have an issue with working with you? So at the moment, um, it's just me. Um, I have had interns. So in 2018, um, I actually worked with the University of Edinburgh College of Art and I had three History of Art students um, as part of their academic placement um, come work for me for one semester. And that's where we created this exhibition called Misconceptions, where it's more an educational exhibition for you to understand the context of Haiti. And especially since um, a lot has happened since 2010. Um, there's the Oxfam scandal um, in Haiti. Now Oxfam is now banned completely from Haiti. They went through two hurricanes. Um, so it's more kind of a, where we are at and where Haiti is at. <coughs> um, but it's just really me kind of pushing the business forward. I'm interested in um, what you miss about being an architect and whether you're planning to go back to design. So, um, just talking to Casey about it, but I think one thing I really miss about architecture is architecture school. Because I think it's a platform where you can actually be pretty much creative. You don't have to um, adhere to your boss, your line manager, and your clients. And there's no time pressure and there's no money pressure. So one thing I do miss is actually architecture school. Um, but I guess the luxury of having this kind of passion project is that I'm hoping that I can actually be more creative and actually working in architecture. And I constantly kind of, I still design, um, but design in a different way. Um, and it's not an architectural response, but it's more working with the artisans Crazy products that I know will sell in certain markets. Um, but my hope is that I can work with them to then build um, ultimately an art center in Haiti. Um, and I think that's kind of my, my end goal, my, my big audacious goal of, of also why um, I want to set up for field art. I think it's also the experience of our community that um, having a charity that is purely reliant on funding and grants and charity, I don't think that's a sustainable model either. So that's where social enterprise comes in. And for me, if I can find a balance between selling art and using art to then fund architectural projects, then I'm hoping that that could be a possible solution um, for the future, and especially when we develop. So is this um, in Haiti? Yeah. So yeah, so um, some projects, um, there's, there's still designs. Um, and because they ran out of money, they didn't have money to start it. But um, 50, 50 projects um, were completed. And even though they ran out of money, they still managed to complete it. So it was not just like the, the five making that you showed us, like, yeah. in the Yeah, so I think um, because what, what their model was, was 
So there's still a foundation that funded one school. So um, for the completion of that school, so it's always, the funding stream was always, depending on the project, in two or three phases. So if they managed to fundraise for phase one, that's the design stage and the land sourcing stage. Um, then for kind of the second funding stream would be the actual construction of materials. And then if there were, if they went over budget, which the majority of projects do go over budget, then there would be the third sourcing um, to complete it. Um, and I can happily say that most of the projects that were being constructed are completed. Um, that they didn't just leave it in the ruins for them. Um, I think, um, I think one of them is. So you see, so that was the 3D rendering, and that's the completed score next to it. And you can see that's the metal art that they turned into a door. So for me, that's kind of <coughs> where I actually I see um, art can actually inform architectural responses as well on the ground, um, which is why my ultimate goal is to kind of merge the two and hopefully fourth world art can then um, head back into architecture. And what's the percentage of the products sold in terms of money that goes back to the people in Haiti? So I buy directly, so at the moment, how to build the business, and that's purely what I'm doing is building the business, is that I don't take a salary from it. Um, that all the art sells, and however much money I get from the art, I use that to buy more art. So at the moment, it's building that business. So um, I have no overheads, which I'm quite lucky about, um, which is why I still have a day job. So it gives me more flexibility, um, that it's not, I'm not focused just and financially reliant on, um, on the business to kind of fund myself which gives me more flexibility that all the art that sells and the money that comes in, that's my capital to buy more art. And that's kind of how I'm growing it, and that's how it has grown in the last kind of three to four years. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of... Because I, I imagine transport would be a significant cost to bring the artwork over. Yes, logistics always gives me a headache. And um, last Christmas, um, my logistic man pulled my art to ransom, so that was quite stressful. Um, but I managed to get the art in the end um, through a lot of uh, negotiation. And I think doing business in Haiti is also really difficult because they're also in survival mode. And what I mean by that is, what you can give me now, you give me now. So there isn't about building relationship, there isn't a long-term relationship. It's what you have, you give me now. So it's kind of, when you're trying to build a business, and especially a young business, it's very hard that I don't have, you know, 100,000 pounds just sitting there that can then be a goal that I can tap into. So um, it's kind of communication and, and working with my contacts to help me then get the art out. So that's kind of, um, so logistics is expensive, um, but it's, it's doable but it just means that you just have to pay a higher premium. Um, but I think, for me as well, I think art should be affordable, and part of the ethos of the fourth world art is affordable art. Because I'm not trying to promote a particular artist that will then garner 100,000. For me, it's about supporting more people, and if I can buy more art from more artisans, then to me, that consistency then provides a job. So that's kind of how I'm building my business. Um, so it's kind of numbers as opposed to just one or two. You know, it's very kind of art that you managed to find. Yeah, so um, again, I think half of what I bring in is basically what can sell. As much as I would like um, certain pieces of art, if they don't sell, then I can't actually um, by that type of art. So it's very much um, a customer response as well and knowing the market and knowing what will work and what doesn't work. And I think the metal art, um, they are the best sellers um, and especially my angels, um, especially during Christmas. And I think they are my biggest sellers and they are really unique. Um, and the tree of life, 
Um, so painting-wise, so this, this particular painting, as you can see, it's more accessible. It kind of is more akin to maybe the French Renaissance type of painting. Um, whereas the more ethnic pieces of art, um, they don't sell as well. And because you've got kind of um, abstract people in it that, um, I guess I, I never mentioned it, but um, you know, people are probably liking that to voodoo. Because in Haiti, um, spirituality and Buddhism is very high. And that is also part of their culture and their cultural identity. And that also informs a lot of the art. But if you actually see voodoo art, they freak me out. They, that's, that's, that's an avenue which I just, I'm going to stay away. Because they literally use plastic dolls and stick it onto a canvas and have like, kind of Taino art and, and kind of symbolism that kind of surrounds it. But for me, it's, it's not my cup of tea and I don't think, I'm, I don't think people here would buy that. Um, so it's, it's, it's more unique things, more like the metal art that has sold the best. Um, um, I was just going to ask, um, <clears throat> you said that fundraising for the lab is quite hard to work with. But I'm just thinking through your experiences of going and coming back, or finding the back, and going back to the back. Have you maybe picked up any sort of projects or when you can do that specifically for the back? Is there a way that you think that you could find those projects? Yeah, so I think that there's like two different ways to approach it. the divide between star architect and developmental architect. And I had the, the pleasure of meeting him in person at a conference. <coughs> and one thing he said, which still kind of sits with me, is you have to work within the industry you're in. Um, so you still have to work for the rich clients. Um, but then by building up your reputation there, that gives you the luxury to then actually, if you're passionate about developmental response, then it gives you the passion to be able to then do that yourself. And I think indirectly what he means is he self-funds the design responses. Um, and by doing that means that he has to keep kind of the mainstream projects going. And I think that is one way to kind of, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, if you don't have money, you can't do this. Um, and especially in places like Haiti, where it's really expensive. Um, you know, land is expensive, working with people is expensive, materials are expensive. So you need quite a lot of backing and financial backing to kind of get any <coughs> projects going. But I think for us, especially within an academic setting, is thinking that that should shouldn't discourage you from finding a solution and finding a way to make that sustainable, um, to kind of show that design is worth fundraising for and that architects have a place, especially post-disaster rebuilding. And I think um, there's, a, there's a few architects now, but again, the way they kind of sustain such projects is actually doing mainstream projects, winning contracts, and then as a company deciding to put aside um, X number of profits to then help with these um, developmental projects. And I think um, especially when, you know, especially architecture, you know, it, it's not the cheapest skill and it's not, um, it's not one that lay people tend to understand about either. Um, and I think that doesn't help because of these star architects that are building these artisan sculptures instead of actually responding sometimes to how people interact in certain spaces. Um, but I think um, I hope that answered the question because I think it's it's it's, it's a hard one. <coughs> and I think with the likes of so in the UK there's Article Twenty Five that um, does what architecture humanity does. Again, they're very, very reliant on fundraising. And I think they're very fortunate that because they're the only 
British-based architectural charity that a lot of architectural practices actually support them um, and become their ben benefactors. So it's kind of speaking to those who actually understand the value um, of architecture, especially in certain situations, um, for example, like in Haiti. Do you have any more questions for tonight? Thank you very much, Lily, for coming to your lecture series. And we've got drinks upstairs, but before then, can we please give a round of applause to Lily?